Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here, not only to meet so many old friends, colleagues from my political life uh, or academic life, but especially to see such a packed audience of young people. Uh, of course, the future belongs to them, and our task is uh, to try to, well, give some ideas to them, perhaps uh, drawn from our life experience and political and other experience. Well, now you are going to hear another version, to some degree, of the previous talk, uh, which was done from a professional economist, if I suppose that his background is that. And now you will hear a story from a historian. Well, besides, uh, I am not a social or economic historian, let alone an economist. Uh, I am a political historian, mainly. And uh, my, my qualifications to speak here uh, go back, on the one hand, uh, to 20-year experience in public life, political life, uh, after the great changes, but also being an expert uh, and a professional in 20th century history, and uh, also uh, somebody who had lived under communism, and I think uh, somebody who understands uh, communism and also its afterlife. Well, as we all know, uh, I will say a few words, f first of all, about uh, the ups and downs of, of capitalism in Hungary and in general in, in Central Europe. Well, as we all know, the Industrial Revolution in the Western world uh, introduced uh, uh, a kind of great improvement in material life uh, in uh, moral life in moral attitudes and uh, also in health, uh, in, in public health, uh, longer life expectancy. So it, it was a promising uh, kind of phenomenon. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we can see that capitalism, the story of capitalism, went hand in hand with the political changes uh, which got involved more and more people in the political process culminating in universal suffrage and, uh, well, modern representative democracy. All that was encompassed in the idea of uh, progress and optimism. And uh, going back to 100 years, uh, early 20th century, uh, we saw uh, even more general conviction about, if you like, capitalism, about the modern world, although questions already started to arise. But uh, by that time, the capitalist system came to dominate not only the so-called advanced world, the Western world, but penetrated all the continents and uh, spread to the remotest corner of the world. The very serious shortcomings uh, and, and uh, excesses of the capitalist system were gradually corrected thanks to such critical authors uh, like Saint-Simon in France, Proudhon, and then Marx, uh, and theorists, especially English, Locke, and, and many other people. And also the political movements like social democracy arising particularly in the late 19th century, and uh, Christian socialism. So all that uh, held out the hope uh, that really the world was going endlessly uh, to a kind of better future. Uh, Ramsay MacDonald, uh, the first British Labour Prime Minister, expressed it in an interesting sentence. He uh, said that the world is moving up and up and up, and on and on and on. I think it's a very apt uh, kind of summary of that optimism. Even the less advanced uh, part of the world, uh, in, first of all, Central and Eastern Europe and other continents, came to believe that uh, uh, Capitalism combined with this uh, growing participatory democracy will make the world a much better place. And they will, uh, the less advanced countries will, ab will be able to catch up with the advanced world. Well, of course, the First World War, and even more the Great Depression, uh, shattered that, that rosy, optimistic view. Both international and national socialism, that is uh, Hitler and Stalin, rejected, of course, capitalism, at least in words, 
both unfortunately had substantial following. Uh, in the West, mainly among intellectuals, and on a massive scale in, in the less advanced part of Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, or in general in the less advanced countries uh, or underdeveloped regions of the world. Anyhow, uh, versions of these two versions of socialism, if I can say as a, about Nazism or about communism that it was socialism, it was socialism in name, certainly were different from the uh, noble but utopistic ideas of the early socialists. So they really promised and offered a kind of uh, very rapid way uh, to be a prosperous country. But the Second World War, of course, discredited Nazism, and uh, somewhat later, the Soviet practice uh, in Central Europe and, of course, in the Soviet Union itself discredited communism. Uh, starting with the 1950s, uh, Western prosperity revived belief in capitalism, now called uh, the market economy. Behind the Iron Curtain, it was admired uh, for its abundance of goods, which were not available in the East, in, in the communist world, where, of course, everything was in, always in short supply. Uh, I would like now to say a few words about uh, how communism uh, came to an end and how that led to uh, an increasing belief, both in Hungary and in all the communist-dominated countries, uh, in uh, a belief in, in capitalism, in the market economy. Well, inside the Soviet bloc, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, there were very few people who still believed what Nikita Khrushchev, a former Soviet leader, had promised in the early 1960s, namely that Moscow type of socialism would overtake and bury Western capitalism. The mood was increasingly bad in this communist world, but Hungary, my country, offered some hope. It was a relatively good place to live, probably the best in the communist camp, mainly thanks to our 1956 revolution, which, though brutally suppressed by the intervention of the Soviet Union, but earned a kind of respect in, in Moscow. Today, we can see uh, how faithful conclusions uh, Moscow's Hungarian puppet, Jadosh Jansh Kadar, drew from the 56th Revolution. He thought uh, the Hungarians must first be brutally punished. Yes, uh, hundreds of people were executed after the revolution, mainly workers and, and uh, very simple, ordinary people. But after that, uh, the Hungarian society uh, was really literally bribed to be servile, self-seeking, egotist, unscrupulous, coward, cynical, and credulous, and I can add many words, lacking also compassion and any sense of solidarity. I think it was also similar in the communist world, but perhaps more marked in my own country. My friends and I, and many people in Hungary, of course, condemned that Kadar policy, and we were never really pleased with the so-called goulash communism, or with the image of Hungary as the so-called jolliest barrack in the communist bloc. The system became totally discredited by the end of the 1980s, not so much on account of its uh, lack of democracy and, and dictatorial nature, which was of course still there, but because it failed to give a better life. And instead of again, catching up with the West, the gap uh, between the advanced European and West American world and our world was growing. I always maintain, or at least looking back to these 20 years, that uh, prosperity was the best weapon of the West during the Cold War. Well, we know that Gorbachev tried to save the system, not to overthrow it. Uh, uh, he wanted to, to introduce reform to be able to make it more competitive and to be able to keep up uh, the armament race and so on. But that effort uh, only sped uh, up its decline. But I always add uh, that despite uh, the role of Reagan, the role of Gorbachev, perhaps the role of Chancellor Kohl, Mrs. Thatcher, without the people, without primarily the Poles and the Hungarians, who were the first to challenge uh, the one-party state, so, and of course Solidarność's role, and the role of uh, John, Pope, uh, John Paul II, the Pope, and uh, without uh, 
the silent oppositions of the communist countries, including uh, East Germany, becoming more and more vociferous. Uh, the system may have survived uh, for many years or even for decades. Yes, uh, in, in Hungary uh, and in Poland also in the late 80s appeared uh, a group of people very often called the reformist communists or reform communists. Well, they were not idealist people who just came to see the light. Uh, they were rather opportunist people who realized that uh, communism or their communism had uh, reached the end of the road and that perhaps they too may do better uh, financially, economically in a capitalist system. By the 19 end of the 1980s, very few people, uh, in my country at least, had any illusions about communism. Many, uh, even communist party members, learned Western languages, many acquired Western connections, capitalist friends, and uh, even more people in the summer of 1989 jumped on the bandwagon of reform. A Hungarian author, well known in Germany too, uh, Peter Esterházy, coined a wonderful face a phrase about the many turncoats. I quote him, there is rush hour traffic, traffic on the road to Damascus. So how people changed their mantle. This was unexpected uh, for the public, and there was a great relief and a kind of gratitude felt for the communist leaders, in Hungary at least the last generation, to have become so reasonable to be ready to surrender uh, the monopoly of power peacefully. At that time, in the 1980, at the end of 1989 and early 90s, so when the wall, the, the wall fell, and when the first free elections were held all over the communist, former communist world, I think nowhere was there any strong sense for revenge, uh, the desire to punish people. Yes, there was anger only against uh, people who resisted changes, like the dreaded dictator of Romania, Ceausescu. Now, how the miracle happened, I don't think that I have to speak now. Anyhow, the 20th anniversary uh, gave a lot of opportunity, even for young people like here, uh, to recall or uh, to learn uh, how unexpectedly the, all the communist dominoes uh, fell. Uh, but there was a joke in Hungary. and In all the communist countries, there were many jokes making life more bearable. And one, question, one joke was around the following that, uh, what is worse than communism? What comes after that? Obviously, it was a kind of premonition that the transition will not be uh, without very serious pains. But of course, people were not aware of that, although the new politicians like myself did not hide that it, the transition would be a very difficult process. I recall that uh, uh, Actually, recently I came across uh, a book uh, by a German author, Birgit Müller's book entitled Disenchantment with Market Economics, East Germans and Western Capitalism. It was published in English in 2007. And it shows how people reacted to the breakdown of the planned economy at their workplaces in East Berlin immediately after the fall of the wall. In Hungary and in throughout the former communist world, people had similar hopes and illusions about the Western world, and particularly about the consumer society. While the inhabitants of East Berlin knew their Western counterpart only from television uh, and the verbal accounts of relatives and visitors, Hungarians uh, and also Poles were given the possibility to request an exit visa for traveling in Western Europe in the 1970s, 1980s, and they, they had some superficial impression of Western prosperity, which certainly influenced their decision to be happy to quit communism. But unless somebody showed open opposition to the communist system in Hungary, the permission was usually granted once in every two or three years. And uh, they could even buy a modest amount of foreign currency at the official relatively low price. I emphasize this because uh, I think it helps to explain on the one hand why Hungary and, uh, and Poland were the first uh, to push for radical changes, but also that uh, these two countries and the population were really exposed uh, to this superficial uh, element of, of uh, prosperity. Kärtnerstrasse in Vienna and the shop windows, the department stores. Yes, just my friend from Romania knows very well that that was 
the big attraction uh, more powerful than the, the quest for democracy. Well, uh, I have, well, I think communism is not unknown uh, in this audience, but uh, it is increasingly a matter of the past. And uh, I think uh, I have to explain uh, briefly a few things. That uh, on the one hand, uh, how the former communists uh, were quite successful, uh, not only transforming themselves into Democrats, but also transforming themselves into capitalists. But, and that will be really a, a kind of uh, important message uh, for me uh, in this talk, that uh, post-1990 uh, capitalism in Hungary is very much linked to the former communists. And with their conduct, they compromised capitalism itself in the eyes of the public. And similar tendencies did appear in other former communist dominated countries too, but especially strong they were in Russia and Ukraine. So uh, the communist uh, leadership uh, was heavily defeated, thoroughly defeated, practically in all the former communist countries uh, in the first free elections in the 1990s. Uh, and in Hungary, I think it was uh, more noticeable or perhaps actually it was not so much noticed, but uh, what happened was that uh, the former communists uh, uh, ousted, so to say, from uh, political life, although not legally, and actually they scored 10% uh, at the 1990 first election, which was, of course, a very modest showing. Uh, they uh, went into kind of business. And I personally, as foreign minister, was very happy when uh, uh, an old communist diplomat uh, voluntarily left uh, uh, his or her job and went into business because I, they, they were not so successful, not uh, very hardworking uh, as diplomats. But uh, what was more important, really, uh, that uh, uh, whereas uh, the new political elite, whether in Czechoslovakia or, or in Poland, in Hungary, in Romania, it was a little bit different story because the political transformation came a little bit later, I think, in 1996 with the election of a real non-communist uh, President Constantinescu. But anyhow, so in all these countries, uh, uh, privatization was on the agenda, and it was essential. Uh, well, of course, uh, it was communism which uh, confiscated property uh, without any compensation, uh, but uh, we really returning to capitalism, returning to a market economy, uh, well, ownership uh, had to be clarified. And uh, well, in some countries, uh, there was partial reprivatization, like uh, uh, all uh, in, in Czechoslovakia, uh, buildings, factories uh, were returned to previous owners or their descendants. But in other countries like Hungary, it was found impossible and uh, there was a, only a compensation for whatever you lost through communism and, and uh, nationalization. But uh, so it meant that uh, it was quite easy to turn state assets, uh, nationalized assets, uh, into private property. And whereas on the one hand we wanted to uh, sell it uh, to the highest bidder uh, and uh, mainly to Western companies, uh, it uh, very often happened that uh, there was not uh, much enthusiasm uh, to buy uh, factories which were not per competitive with the West. Well, I think people in East Germany, former East Germany, know very well this story, and you have still the residue of, of that process. But uh, so at a low price, it was possible for uh, former communist bigwigs and their families uh, uh, also to use loans from friends who were running the banks uh, to buy very cheaply state assets. I think this process was especially noticeable in the former Soviet Union, and that is how the so-called oligarchs uh, became so rich and, and uh, powerful. So anyhow, uh, the important aspect of this whole story is that, uh, the, and it is worth really writing, verse reading about, verse studies, that uh, uh, many former communists uh, became quite rich in, in this new capitalist world, and uh, this is one element of the story. Uh, then comes the other question, uh, the disappointment in the changes. 
Well, uh, as I told you already, uh, people, ex well, people were very happy uh, with dictatorship gone, with the system of informers gone. But uh, primarily uh, they wanted prosperity and hoped that uh, by changing the political system, uh, changing the laws and the constitution, uh, prosperity will come, at least a modest version of it, uh, and in a few years' time uh, they will be members of the European community, the European Union, and uh, slowly but uh, steadily, uh, also thanks to the uh, policy of, uh, of uh, compensation funds and uh, structural funds, uh, these countries uh, will be really just like, they will follow the example of Spain, Portugal, Greece, who after dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, uh, uh, turned to democracies and uh, to quite prosperous countries. Uh, the non-communist governments, uh, I think uh, the first governments, uh, well, did the right things mainly. Sometimes it was called the shock therapy, like in, in Poland. Uh, but uh, we hardly noticed how the former communists consolidated their hold on the economy. I, now comes the story of these disappointments, the first wave. I have two quotations uh, for that. One is from Aristotle. It is easier to be a slave than to be a free man. At first it is shocking, but uh, we know even from modern uh, slavery in America, North America, that yes, uh, it is not good to be a slave, but uh, you are being looked after if you have a good master and so on. So yes, communism was a version of slavery, uh, but uh, it uh, provided, well, some, the basic necessities for everyone. Uh, well, transportation, uh, rent was very cheap, very low, uh, basic food items uh, were also. Uh, so what I like to, how I like to describe it, and this is the second quotation, it is really immodestly from me. Uh, very little was available in the communist period, but that little was affordable. Now, with the changes, everything became available, but very little was affordable. And that, I think that is the crux of the matter. So people are unhappy, were unhappy under communism, even economically, but everybody appeared to be poor, and uh, some other communist countries even looked poorer, so you could look down upon them. So that was something which people accepted, and that's especially the case in Hungary, that, and the communist leaders always said, oh, look at Poland, they are striky because they are lazy, uh, and you just uh, keep on working, and you will have a little better life every day. So uh, that was something which was very easy to, to swallow. And with the changes, uh, well, some people became conspicuously rich, uh, new cars appeared on the street, and many people, on the other hand, lost their jobs, which was also a safe thing earlier. Everybody had to have a job. It was a punishable crime not to have a, a job. Uh, and now, of course, uh, in my own country, well, a substantial percentage of the workplace was laid off and uh, lived uh, on a modest uh, benefit, uh, social benefit, uh, unemployment benefit. Uh, and uh, so even without, before the present crisis, so the first few years after 1990 were really hard for many people and uh, they could simply, they not could, but they envied uh, those who profited from the changes. They also envied the politicians uh, who were not the biggest uh, beneficiaries of the system, but uh, mainly the, the new business people, people who were connected to the multinational Western companies who after all did buy up uh, many of the assets uh, in all these countries. And people also uh, st started to develop a longing uh, for the past, uh, not only for this economic safe life, but uh, yes, there was free education free health care. Yes, it was low quality and people were always complaining about the long lines they had to spend in consulting rooms of the physicians and so on. And also people had to bribe from the nurses to the doctors to have an adequate kind of uh, service. But uh, it was still nominally free. And so with the new system gradually making everything more and more expensive, it was also annoying. So it is not a, it 
was not strange that practically in all the former communist countries, the first, after the first three elections, the next elections were won by the former communists. Of course, uh, they were no longer called communists, but the social democrats. And uh, they were successful usually in uh, preventing genuine old social democrats or people who uh, were not uh, coming from a communist background. They prevented them, and so the Western social democracy needed allies uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. So after some hesitations, they endorsed the so-called post-communists. And uh, starting in Lithuania and in Poland, and followed by Hungary, so in 1993, 1994, everywhere the uh, former communists came back uh, uh, to office at free elections, which certainly in 1990 nobody would have predicted, including themselves. Uh, yes, uh, very soon uh, it turned out that uh, uh, whatever people expected from them uh, cannot be fulfilled. Uh, a friend of mine said uh, at that time that, uh, yes, uh, Hungarians thought that bread would be again something like 3.60 forints per kilo, but they did not realize that it would not be, it would be really 360, but not in forints, but in dollars. So, so that was uh, uh, the second disappointment that, uh, yes, it, it was not simply enough to change the government and to bring back the former communist uh, uh, life would not be different. And actually, I think, again, what is a more or less general pattern is that uh, the former communists, now socialists, uh, were becoming, uh, behaving like true capitalists, and actually uh, they were quite clever uh, in uh, the financial world, uh, in getting uh, high jobs, uh, in the multinational companies, partly through the connections which they built in the last years of communism. So uh, they were not cap the classical capitalists uh, who established factories giving jobs to millions of people, uh, but uh, in other ways they really followed what Karl Marx once described as the primary accumulation of capital, when uh, using rather dirty methods uh, people, some people, enriched themselves. I think there is a lot of similarity between the new rich uh, in the former so communist world and uh, the early 19th century capitalist uh, world. Uh, the majority of the 10.5 million Hungarian citizens, so to say proletarianized, during 45 years of communism, resented that while the traditional shortage of goods was over, affluence spread only to a small section of the population. Under communism, people learned, or at least thought, that life was a zero-sum game. One person's gain was seen in direct correlation with another person's loss. And so they believed that the arrival of the new rich meant that they would have become poor or poorer. Well, as I told you anyhow, that uh, uh, by the end of the 19th 90s, uh, it turned out that uh, uh, returning uh, to the old communist uh, leadership and, uh, and the younger echelon would not make things better. And uh, so the, the third elections were usually again won by non-communists, uh, uh, civic party, the Fidesz civic party in Hungary, and anyhow democratic uh, parties uh, in, in on all the communist world. But uh, uh, coinciding with the second half of the 90s uh, and early uh, 21st century, irrespective of uh, the political composition of the governments, we could see that uh, after all there were successes and, and uh, good results. So there is an apparent success story uh, in those years and uh, I will just quote a few Western statements uh, showing, showing that. Perhaps I will cut it short because uh, I will not be able to prove how the loss of faith uh, happened. But, uh, well, for example, uh, uh, the Financial Times, uh, an article or the Washington Post uh, in 2006, Central Europe appears to be enjoying a golden age. Its countries hold NATO and European Union club cards. Billions of euros 
in uh, EU funds are flowing in. Economies in the region are fast expanding. Latvian growth rates outpace China's, and all the other countries are head and shoulders above Eurozone levels. Central Europeans are richer than ever, buying DVD players, plasma televisions, and new homes. Every element is in place for a success story. That was from the uh, Financial Times. Uh, from the economist, uh, the best performing economies, economies are, get, are setting a, quite a space, quite a pace. Sorry. Estonia and Latvia posted 10% GDP growth in 2005, reminiscence of Asia's tigers. The question now is whether the new Europeans can keep it up and catch the richer half of their continent. Few worry about external shocks, though Hungary, with its big current account and budget deficit, looks vulnerable. Uh, finally, no, I leave that out. So uh, I mentioned that the success story, and uh, yes, I think uh, people started to have a, now again a faith that perhaps uh, with, it would take a longer time than expected and hoped for, but uh, with the new investment, uh, with the very uh, visible improvements in, in, in uh, well, transportation, construction of uh, motorways, uh, and of course many new buildings or, or old buildings being destroyed, so after all, it was good uh, to change, uh, uh, well, to switch from, from communism and the command economy uh, to, uh, to a capitalist market economy. But then uh, came the blow, the, the, the great blow, global, the financial crisis, the recent financial crisis. In fact, uh, be, even before it hit Hungary and before it hit the world, uh, we could see in my own country, Hungary, and now we see no longer a kind of common general pattern, that uh, in 2002, uh, the former communist or the socialist party uh, unexpectedly won the election. And I don't want to sound partisan, and I am not a member of any political party now in Hungary, but their performance was extremely poor, dismal, and my country, which was often called the front runner, or one of the front runners, the Visegrad three, later the Visegrad four, were expected to be the first, not only in NATO, but also in the European Union, but the European Union waited for a long time. We had a quite long engagement period, but finally in 2004, as you all know, uh, there was this big bang and growth, uh, and uh, so uh, whereas all the countries, uh, former communist countries, really started to show impressive results. I quoted some, uh, not in Hungary, and uh, by the mid-2000, uh, uh, so the first decade of the 21st century, so Hungary going down and down, and uh, well, that is obviously the responsibility of the current government. Well, it was especially uh, due to large-scale corruption, which is um, sadly, uh, to be found all over the former communist world, or actually beyond the communist world too, but was particularly striking. And I always maintain that uh, this uh, very strong uh, kind of preoccupation with a consumer society, with all the, uh, well, goodies, with the, the cars, with the possibility to travel and to spend your vacation in the most exotic uh, places, that explains partly the rise of crime, the rise of corruption, because yes, by ordinary work, by ordinary salaries, wages, these are not affordable. But uh, if in some way, really uh, bending the law, and uh, really by criminal actions, uh, you can be get a lot of money, then, then you enjoy all these things which are quite common in, a, in the Western world. So that explains uh, all the golden handshakes which uh, were a part of particular reason for scandals in the last year in, in Hungary when became uh, exposed. And, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that this uh, last few years, uh, when capitalism in Hungary was no longer successful and it was conducted by people who, no matter what their background, political background was, really uh, professed themselves to be uh, free, uh, free market capitalists, uh, 
believing in, in uh, really uh, all the kind of uh, statements and all the notions uh, put forward by leading economists uh, of the late 19th and uh, late, late 20th century and early 21st century. So Hungarian average people started to put the blame for their miseries or for difficulties uh, partly on the leaders, but also on the very system of uh, present-day capitalism, which is usually called uh, globalization. So just uh, an example of that. Uh, actually, uh, the media, uh, which is sometimes called the right uh, of center media, uh, there are an, there's an increase in populist demands, criticism directed at the World Bank, the IMF, the U.S., and globalization in general. Uh, the Economist, uh, in a recent uh, article, put Hungary out of 42 advanced countries to be the lowest but one performance uh, for the coming year. Minus 1% growth is expected after 7% uh, uh, minus uh, growth rate last year. Uh, industrial production in Hungary fell by 9% last year why inflation exceeded 5%, the highest in the EU, whereas Poland is uh, expected to grow by 2%, the Czech Republic by 1%. I must confess that I am a bit uh, reluctant to say such things because as a politician, as an ambassador, uh, I th think I had good reason to speak uh, uh, good about my country, about good results, and there were good results. And uh, now I simply uh, cannot uh, speak about, uh, well, promising or good results. So nobody can question that the main responsibility for the poor showing rests with the performance uh, and policies of the socialist-led governments of the last eight years. But a large section of Hungary's population, prompted by several media organs uh, and the people who appear there, believes that capitalism, at least its current version, and its leading exponents are to blame. A recent article in the Daily Magyar Nemzet, which is a center-right paper, states, uh, stated that the aim of the foreign invest investors was only to take over the home market, first in small retail trade and in the agricultural market, and that is the major cause of the high of a 10% uh, unemployment rate in Hungary. While shops and enterprises owned by Hungarians keep their profits and invest them, the multinationals largely take the profit out of the country, the paper's rights. They also delay their payments, often by 180 days. At the same time, they enjoy tax holidays and government subsidies. And the conclusion of the article was, what is needed is the protection of the home market and ending the discrimination against home companies. Well, uh, I just wanted to show... Uh, uh, in kind of summary, the legacy of communism, which I actually already explained, uh, uh, how the transition, the shock therapy, uh, worked or, or more or less worked, what we had to do, new constitutions, privatization, GDP at first fell, and there was high, un high unemployment, but then the achievements, not only political achievements, human rights achievements, but also growing pro uh, productivity and so on. Also expanding education, especially at the university level, but unfortunately now it means many jobless graduates. Uh, well, integration in Western Europe was successful, especially with uh, EU membership uh, and uh, causes of the disillusionment. I also mentioned, uh, uh, but uh, as Oli Rehn, um, EU Commission for Enlargement said many doomsday scenarios preceded the Eastern Enlargement, none of which has materialized. So uh, I already mentioned many of the dis in fact, uh, dissatisfaction symbols. Uh, of course, even in the European Union, uh, well, the new members are not really equal, so especially agricultural subsidies are considerably lower, and that makes the very hard for the agricultural sector uh, to compete with subsidized uh, products of the, the old members. Uh, and, uh, well, new jobs and wealth started to come, unevenly distributed. I mentioned growing crime. That I mentioned the success story, so we can skip it. Uh, 
and now the impact of the financial crisis. So, as you can see very well and know very well, growth stopped in, or slowed down considerably. Multinational companies are moving out. Credit became very expensive, foreign currency loans especially, which many people irresponsibly raised. Austerity programs raising taxes. Uh, more governments are more ready to do that than reducing spending. And uh, a few uh, graphs from a recent poll taken by the Pew Research Center. I suppose quite a few of you are familiar with that. And uh, it shows really, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, I hope it is seen well, especially the red line is the Hungarian one. So the pattern is, is quite similar, as you know, and you can see. But what is more important for my story, although that is the basic explanation, is that approval. So what are the attitudes of people? And you can see that uh, approval to, of change to democracy, comparing 1991 and 2009, uh, well, there is a fall everywhere, but it is not very substantial. Uh, although in Hungary and in Lithuania, where the economic performance is the worst, uh, even democracy is to some degree blamed for that. But what is really important and stunning Regime change is not much appreciated. Approval of change to capitalism. Again, comparing uh, figures in 1991. Uh, you can see that uh, in the former East Germany, there is not much change. You can look at the change minus how many points. But uh, Bulgaria, we heard the story, 20% uh, loss of uh, confidence uh, or approval rate. And uh, Bal Lithuania, another a poor performing country, 22, and Hungary is unfortunately, very sadly, is heading. Uh, in 1991, there were very high approval rate to, for capitalism, and now it is very low, the lowest. Disenchantment with the present system. Were people worse off, are people worse off today than under communism? Which is, of course, a very unrealistic uh, kind of uh, feeling, but it is a, still a, a feeling which exists. So you can see, again, Hungary, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Lithuania. So this is the kind of uh, uh, list of countries, uh, how much they are uh, disillusioned or disenchantment. Democratic values are still mostly accepted, and that is very important and very encouraging. And you can see that, uh, well, actually, in that, Hungary is still quite high, and I'm happy to say that. Uh, well, there are many dangers facing Europe, but it is not uh, so much of uh, part of my own story. Uh, there's nationalism, populism, extremism. The Western media very, is very often sensational and is overdoing the changes and uh, the existing problems. But, uh, of course, energy dependence is, is a very serious danger. Well, we can... These are the pipelines and then potential pipelines, which is, again, not exactly our stories. Conflicts about or over national minorities is a serious issue, but, again, this is not part of our story. But uh, uh, basically, uh, before I try to, to end up with some optimism, moderate optimism, I think uh, we find uh, something quite interesting, uh, namely that... Uh, the Central European critics of globalization, that is present-day capitalism, were until recently considered to be kind of neo-Marxists, as many of their sentences sounded like taken from the old Marxist political economy textbooks. But with the international, international financial crisis, at least some of their views received credibility, as shown by the recent article from the Financial Times. And if you permit, well, uh, I will quote only a part of it. Uh, so it says that, the, I quote, the global financial crisis has changed all that. At this year's the, the, the Davos, the Western delegates seemed depressed, defensive, or even mildly deranged, in the case of Nicolas Sarkozy, the French president. After listening to Mr. Sarkozy's passionate attack on financial capitalism, one Russian participant was overheard saying that he had found the experience pleasantly nostalgic. He remembered hearing many similar speeches in the Soviet Union. 
Well, uh, with all the above facts and perceptions, uh, I am not pessimistic about the future, whether in Central Europe in general and in Hungary in particular, not even about the popularity of capitalism once its excesses in Hungary are brought under control. After all, neither the politics uh, nor the economics of communism, the old command economy, has any chance uh, to return. The formalities of democracy are not endangered. And I showed you that uh, actually people still have a belief in democracy. But besides honest government, uh, we also need a successful market economy, ending the present day poverty and bringing the, pro the promise of prosperity closer. And I, my hope is really looking at Germany after the Second World War. Uh, Germany unexpectedly, very quickly, became a prosperous country, largely thanks to its, of course, uh, diligent and well-educated people, and also to what was called the social market economy. Uh, the very principle, the very policy uh, was attempted and introduced in Hungary in 1990. Uh, we did not have enough time, and uh, well, there were new governments uh, who did not follow that pattern. So uh, with the elections coming very soon in April in Hungary, uh, there is a strong likelihood that we will have a new government, a non-communist government, uh, dedicated uh, to growth, dedicated to uh, eradicating corruption, and uh, dedicated to the social market economy, uh, which will be more difficult now, I'm afraid, than it was in 1990, because then the whole world uh, really supported the former communist countries and uh, uh, showed sympathy for that. Now I see, of course, there are so many other problems, not only in Central Europe, but all over the world. So it is up to our countries, up to our elections, up to our electorate uh, uh, to introduce new policies. And uh, so I, I do hope that, uh, well, actually I'm convinced that there is no alternative to the present capitalism, but it must put its house into order first of all now. And uh, of course, we must follow uh, well, these measures, which unfortunately do not come quickly enough, and uh, the expectations that the crisis uh, will introduce substantially new policies uh, in the advanced countries has not materialized so far. But uh, the, latest, the, the latest figures of the last two days may again uh, wake up people, and uh, well, we stand or fall together, and, but I hope that we will stand. Thank you. Thank you.